Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Really happy to be with you all here today and to be joined by our wonderful guest, Dr. Richard Schwartz. Richard C. Schwartz earned his PhD in marriage and family therapy from Purdue University and began his career as a systemic family therapist and as an academic. Formerly an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago and later at Northwestern University, he's currently on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Grounded in systems thinking, Dr. Schwartz developed Internal Family Systems, or IFS, a highly effective evidence-based therapeutic model that depathologizes the multi-part personality in response to clients' descriptions of various parts within themselves. While exploring that inner terrain with traumatized clients, he stumbled onto the discovery of an undamaged healing essence that he calls the self with a capital S. And that led him on the spiritual journey described in his latest book, which we are discussing today. It's titled, No Bad Parts, Healing Trauma and Restoring Wholeness with the Internal Family Systems Model. This is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it to everybody. Dr. Gabor Maté says this about No Bad Parts. In this highly readable volume, Dr. Richard Schwartz articulates and deftly illustrates his Internal Family Systems Model one of the most innovative, intuitive, comprehensive, and transformational therapies to have emerged in the past century. Featured speaker for national professional organizations, Dr. Schwartz has published over 50 articles about IFS and a number of books, including You're the One You've Been Waiting For and Greater Than the Sum of Our Parts. Those are both available at Banyan as well. Dr. Schwartz's IFS Institute offers training for professionals and the general public. And if you'd like more information, you can visit his website, which is ifs-institute.com. Banyan community, please join me in a warm welcome. Our honored guest today, Richard Schwartz. Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Ross. I'm honored by your interest and by Banyan's interest. And, uh, Looking forward to it. Thank you. Now, I wanted to open things up with a a quote from your book about what you call these parts. You're saying no bad parts. So maybe for our audience to start understanding what parts are, you write, it turns out that parts aren't afflictions and they aren't the ego. They're little inner beings who are trying their best to keep you safe and to keep each other safe and to keep it together in there. They have full range personalities. Each of them have different desires, different ages, different opinions, different talents, and different resources. Instead of just being annoyances or afflictions, which they can be while in their extreme roles, they're wonderful inner beings. Can you help us more fully grasp what these parts actually are, Richard? Yeah, actually that describes them pretty well. And it's not, it's been a tough sell to convince a very skeptical culture and psychotherapy community that this is the case. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it's been a 40 year journey of 
of discovery, uh, this didn't come out of my brain, it came out of my clients. I really learned all this from my clients. Didn't know anything about what parts were when I started hearing about them from, from clients. And, uh, but what I was taught has held up over all these 40 years that we all have what I call parts, other, other systems call subpersonalities or ego states, but, uh, and, and none of those words do them justice because they are like full range inner personalities and that it's the nature of the mind to have them, that they're all valuable and it's a great, you know, blessing that we have all these different ways of looking at the world and all these different qualities that help us in different ways in our lives. But that trauma and what's called attachment injuries or bad parenting will force them out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be destructive, like you were saying. And so a lot of what we think of as symptoms or various, particularly psychological symptoms, but also all kinds of different uh, obstacles, internal obstacles in our lives are the product of these parts, but in their extreme roles. So a lot of the, the work that I do is helping them out of their extremes, back into their naturally valuable states. And part of the reason I call it internal family systems is because it's very much like a uh, family in the sense that family therapy's big insight was you can't take a acting out kid out of the family and just tell them to cut it out. You have to understand the dynamics of the family that forced him into that role to protect himself or to protect the other family members and change those dynamics. And then he's freed up to be who he's designed to be. And it's really, it turns out amazingly that this is actually the same with these parts. So just to go back to your original question, you know, if, if you're facing some kind of a dilemma and you hear one voice saying, go for it, and another, another one saying, don't you dare, what are those? <laughs> are those just two little thoughts? Or if, as I'm going to contend, if you were to focus on one and ask questions of it, you would learn that it's not just a go for it little urge inside of you, but it actually has a lot of uh, information for you and a lot of different feelings and is a full inner personality. And same with the other one. And they're just battling inside about how to keep you safe or help you in your life. Right. Thank you. So all of these parts, they have a different, they have different goals, different desires. What is, is there a common unifying thread that a common desire, a common goal that they all have for us? Uh, you know, they have you in common and they, they kind of know that. And so they all want the best for you. It's just that, again, similar to families, they have different ideas about what's best. And again, when they get into these protective roles, uh, they, they become quite extreme in one direction or the other. And then when one gets extreme in one direction, another has to polarize, kind of balance things out. And, and over time, they'll get more extreme. The more one extreme one gets, the more the other gets. Even though they're both trying to keep your ship afloat, leaning out, like two sailors leaning out in opposite directions. Each thinks if I don't keep leaning out, the, the ship's going to capsize because the other one's leaning out. And that, that definition of polarization holds up at all levels of human system, actually. I, and I love that about this book is you show how these inner systems, it's the same, the same structure applies to our our relationships, our companies, corporations, countries. Can you talk a little bit about, basically what you say in the book is, you know, there's all of these crises and problems in our world. And it's not just an environmental or an economic or a pandemic crisis. There's an underlying psychological crisis that all of us are facing. And this kind of work can actually be the solution to these grander problems. 
Yeah, as I explored all this and did start thinking about, you know, is this map of the mind that I'm, I've uh, put together, uh, is it similar to the way countries are organized and corporations are organized and, and families? And became quite amazed that actually it is. It applies at all these different levels. And, uh, and it's the same way to, to change it at all these different levels. That if we could not only think that all parts are, are there aren't any bad parts, there aren't any bad people, there aren't actually any bad countries, they're all just trying to protect themselves. And they, they often are stuck in the past, these parts and countries and people during traumas. And so the, the way these parts are forced out of their naturally valuable states is that they get frozen in time during a bad experience in your life. And also during that experience, they take in the extreme beliefs and emotions that entered your system during that trauma that we call burdens. And they then, these burdens, extreme beliefs and emotions attach to the part, almost like a virus, like the coronavirus, and then drive the way it operates thereafter. And so healing in this model is actually very concrete. It's getting them out of where they're stuck in the past and helping them unburden, helping them release these extreme beliefs and emotions. And once that happens, they sort of like a curse has been lifted and they transform into their naturally valuable states. And then we can bring in other parts who've been polarized with them and see they don't have to fight now and help them do the same thing and, and like that. You talk about one thing that I found this that really seems foundational, both in our inner work and and then translating that into the way we relate to others, is you talk about why the negative view doesn't work, why the punitive view doesn't work, and it actually creates these reinforcing feedback loops. So I'm wondering, you know, just for our audience to understand what what you mean by no bad parts. Why is it that when we vilify or take a negative view on certain parts of ourselves, even that, that maybe perpetrate the worst possible things, yeah. that, that doesn't actually uh, help to drive the change that's needed? Yeah. Um, you know, the big mistake that our culture and psychotherapy in general has made is to see the part as the burden it carries. So that, uh, you know, you spoke about some of the most heinous kinds of activities. I, I spent seven years working at a treatment center, consulting to a treatment center for sex offenders. And I, you know, I thought, okay, these inner critics turn out to not be what they thought, what we thought they were. And they're actually just trying to protect people. But really the parts that actually raped somebody or molested a kid, could these also not be bad, but just stuck with this stuff that, that uh, drives them to do it and frozen in time. And indeed, even with those kinds of parts and those kinds of perpetrators, it, the model holds up because we wound up helping those offenders get curious about the part that actually did it, that they felt totally ashamed of and had tried to wall off inside and began asking questions about where it was stuck in the past and what happened to create the, that drive. And, you know, it often took them back to when, as a child, they were being uh, abused in some ways, not always sexually, sometimes, and how much this part wanted to protect the system. And to do that, it thought, who has power in this room? It's this guy doing this to me. I'm going to take in his energy. And then it gets stuck with the impulse to hurt people and uh, and gets frozen in the time when when the client's being abused. And as we were able to unburden those parts, they transform too. So all of that was just um, mind blowing to me at the time. Now it's it just feels like common sense, but it, it's really hard to believe. Right, because I think, you know, most of us would think, oh, you know, isn't it just a matter of 
of self-control. Even if you have an impulse like that, you just repress it or suppress it and you never give it life. But it, I think we all know to lesser degrees, the experience of not having that kind of self-control. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that's because that part of ourselves is actually got a protective purpose behind it. Yeah. And, you know, we can use self-control to try to lock up parts like that, or, or even less, uh, less, you know, the part of you that sometimes gives you a panic attack, maybe. Well, you don't want a panic attack, so you try to wall that off inside. Or the part that's stuck back in some uh, tragic moment in your life. You don't want to feel all that anymore, so you lock that part away too. Thinking you're just moving away from the memories and the emotions of it. Not realizing that in doing that, you're actually locking away parts just because they got hurt. Uh, and often the most sensitive parts of you, the parts that, that in some ways are the most valuable because they're the ones that get hurt the most. So as we go through life more and more, we tend to what I call exile different parts of us because either they got hurt or they got stuck with these, these extreme emotions that uh, we tend to get shame for in the outside world and uh, can cause us a lot of trouble in our lives. Uh, not knowing that they aren't just those impulses. They aren't just those emotions. They're actually valuable inner citizens that got burdened and so then they got locked away. I just wanna let our audience know that uh, Dr. Schwartz and I discussed a, a demonstration of this kind of work to help everybody understand more what it looks like. So I've agreed to have him guide me through a bit of a process, which will then lead us into some more questions. And of course, we'll get to some audience questions in the last 15 minutes or so. So please feel free to type those into the Q&A tab on Zoom whenever you feel inspired. Um, maybe before we get into that process, Dr. Schwartz, we could just define the, the ways that you use the word self. So you use the self with a capital S, you use the self with all capitals. Can you help us understand the distinction between these different uh, definitions of self? Yeah, so as I was doing this work and my backgrounds as a family therapist, like you said, I started trying to help people learn about their parts rather than fight with them because I got hip to the fact that the, they weren't what they seemed. And so I would set up these dialogues and uh, I would, maybe I'm having you talk to your critic or something like that. And I'm trying to get you to listen to it rather than fight with it. Cause parts of you hate it because it's so hard on you. And I get those parts to step back and then you get really scared of the critic. And it felt like in, like in family therapy sessions where you try to have a dialogue between two family members and other parts keep jumping in and interfering. And so I began asking clients, could you get the scared one to just relax in there and give us a little space? And the angry one too, the one who hates the critic, just give us a little space. And as I did that, it was like this entirely different person popped out who was, who could have, who was curious about the critic out of the blue and also was calm relative to it and, and confident and even had compassion for it a lot of the time and would say, I, I'm sorry, you have to do this all day. And when I would do the same process with other clients, it was like the same person would pop out suddenly. And when I started asking clients, what part of you is that? They said, that's not a part like these others. That's me or that's myself. So I came to call that the self with a capital S. And it turns out now, 40 years later, thousands of clients later, thousands of people now using this all over the world, we can safely say that that self is in everybody, can't be damaged, knows how to heal, and is just beneath the surface of these parts so that when they open space, it pops out naturally, spontaneously. And that was shocking. That was even more shocking than learning about these other parts and how they weren't bad. Uh, Cause I didn't have anything to, to ground that observation in. And yet here it was. Uh, Cause I'd been taught 
like most therapists, that with attachment theory, you had to get any of those qualities, those what we call C-word qualities, calm, curious, confident, compassion, and also courage, creativity, connectedness, and there's one more. Um, clarity. Yeah. Did you say clarity? Yeah, at the end, yeah. So those are what we call the eight C's of self-leadership, and those have held up as the qualities of self that emerged spontaneously over all these years. And so I didn't have any way to ground that from a psychological point of view. And then some, some clients actually, and then some students started pointing toward spirituality. And it turns out that virtually every spiritual tradition has a word for this, even though very few psycholog psychologies do. And so it seems like I had stumbled onto a way to access what many traditions try to get to in meditation simply by getting these parts to step out. And so that's what I call self. And actually now I believe that that's the big discovery of IFS, uh, that it's there. It's just the service can be accessed very quickly and it can begin the process of both healing in the inner world and also healing in your external relationships as well. You also make the distinction that it's possible for us to use meditation and tapping into pure self as an escape mechanism from going into the, the traumas or the, part, the, the burden parts in us. Can you speak a little bit to this, this idea of spiritual bypassing or using meditation as another kind of addiction or escape? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned earlier that when parts of us get really hurt or feel worthless or terrified, they have the power to make us feel, all of us feel that way. And so we tend to lock them away and we call those exiles. And many people come to spirituality because they've got a lot of exiles they don't know how to handle. And I was one of those people. When I got out of college, I had no clue what I was going to do in my life. And I was very anxious and I was trying my best to keep all that at bay. And I, I learned TM and I did transcendental meditation. I did that for about eight years straight and it was great. It, it gave me access to this other place and I felt much better and I could function better. And, and at the same time, it didn't touch any of that pain or shame or terror that I'd been uh, hiding away. And so that I was using it as a what John Well would call a spiritual bypass. I was staying higher than those flames of emotion. And I was became addicted to the meditations to, to stay that way. And too, too often that's what spiritual practices are used for. Um, and I, I'm, I've, I've got nothing against meditation per se, because I do it myself. But I don't do it to the exclusion of the actual healing work with these exiled parts. So would it be right to say that there's a way to, to use meditation at, to integrate and to bring, bring self into the body? Very much, yeah. And that is what we, I mean, there is a IFS based meditation that I think I wrote about where you find these parts and you ask them to open space and immediately you feel embodied in, in the self place that, as I say, people meditate to get to. And the more you can, your parts trust it's safe to let you be in your body that way, the more they relax and then it becomes a virtuous cycle. Because the more they sense your presence, the less anxious they are because there's a leader there. Uh, and in contrast to many spiritual traditions, what I'm calling self isn't just a kind of compassionate, accepting, passive witness state. It's an active leader that goes to parts and embraces them and loves them and goes to people and does the same. So, uh, yeah, so it's a bit different from a lot of spiritual traditions understanding of these things. Thank you. Maybe, maybe now is a good time for us to, to go into a bit of a, a process here and I'll be, uh, I'll be the, the demonstration guinea pig. guinea pig for our audience here today. And uh, I'm sure that'll bring up some questions for me and for our audience as well for the final 15 minutes.
Well, I appreciate you being a good sport, Ross, and we'll try not to uh, do any damage. <laughs> okay. So where do we begin? Well, uh, you read the book, and so is there a part of you that you'd like to get to know better or change somehow? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the one that I, I kind of identify that I've been working with recently is I've worked a lot with anger over the years. And, uh, you know, I, it's, I'm at a place where it's not a huge issue, but there are still times where there's some anger flare ups at inappropriate times. And I've identified that it's because of this old feeling of overwhelm. It's like that inner part of me that's feeling overwhelmed. Great. So we'll start with the anger and we might get to the overwhelm. How does that sound? It sounds great. All right. So you ready? Yeah. So go ahead and focus on that angry feeling and find it in your body or around your body. Yeah. Where do you find it? I, I feel it in the, the solar plexus and, mm -hmm. and in the throat. Uh -huh. Good. And as you notice it in those places, how do you feel toward it? Yeah, it's it's a, a, a wanting to suppress, push away. This shouldn't be happening. Yeah. So I understand why those other parts feel that way, but we're going to ask them just for a few minutes to relax back and let us just get to know this anger and maybe even help it not have to be so angry. But we can't do it if you have an attitude toward it. So just see if those parts will give us some space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you feel toward it now then? Just, yeah, there's like an open openness, a softening. Good. Yeah. So let it know you're open to getting to know it now. You feel softer toward it. And just see what it wants you to know and don't think of the answer. Just wait and see what comes when you ask that question. Yeah, it's it's basically saying I, I'm your best friend. I want to help you. Great. How does it feel to hear that? How do you feel toward it when you hear that? <laughs> yeah, uh, it feels good. It feels like, good. okay, yeah, I understand. Good. And ask it more about how it'd like to help you. It wants to help me by keeping out those people or situations that have the potential to create disharmony or chaos. Okay, does that make sense to you, Ross? It, it does. It does make sense. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's trying to help you with boundaries, sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, so let it know you get that. And that. that actually seems kind of important. And how's it reacting to being listened to this way? It's like a, a tempering, a cooling down, like a, okay, good. You yeah. Get yeah. Good. And just see if there's anything else it wants you to know. One question could be, what's it afraid would happen? if it didn't re come out so strongly at times. Yeah, it immediately comes up. It's like everything f would feel out of control. Okay. Yeah. And are there parts, other parts that do feel out of control when that happens? Or is it this one? Yeah, I think there are, it feels like a, a number of other parts that feel out of control. Okay. So ask if this is true. So it's protecting those parts. Is that right? From getting triggered? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would it give us permission to go to one of those so we could get it out of where it's stuck in the past and heal it? Yeah, it's it's this it's something in my heart in the heart space that feels stuck. There's like a hardness there. 
And as you notice it there, how do you feel toward it? I guess I feel like I, I, I've known it's there and there's been a, this kind of underlying ignoring of it, but I feel I want to help that part of myself. So you feel that right now? Yeah. So let it know you're ready to help it and see how it reacts. It's like, it's like a little kid getting excited almost. Good. And as you see that kid, how close to him, I assume it's a him, but maybe not. How close are you to that part of you, that, that child, in terms of meters or feet away? Oh, it's right there in, in, in the center of me. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, there's an image of, of myself as like a, I don't know, one or two year old, my little oh, yellow. Oh, very young. Pajamas. Okay. Yeah. 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 And just, let's just uh, keep showing that boy, that young, young boy, that you're there and that you care about him and just see how he reacts. It's almost like he's looking up and realizing for the first time that I'm there. Yeah. And what's that like for him to realize that? It's, he's kind of surprised, it seems. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a certain kind of like re relief. Good. Yeah. Let him know he's not alone anymore and you're going to be taking care of him now. See how he reacts. It's like he's laughing. Laughing because he's happy? Yeah, yeah. It's great. Okay. So we can take the next steps, Ross, and you don't have to disclose where you go with this, but it's, it's for you to know. So if it feels right, ask him where he's stuck in the past with these feelings of overwhelm and out of control. And, and you can share or not what comes to you as you ask that question. Yeah, it's like this. It's the words that come up are, there's two words, chaos and heartbreak of of the, the home. You know? uh -huh. Yeah, of the relationships. So something happened to create chaos and heartbreak in your house. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. I mean, I didn't have any extreme trauma, but it was still that that it was present. It was present. Yeah. Yeah. So tell him to really let you feel and see and sense everything he wants you to about what that was like for him back there. It was like just just shutting down and trying to escape internally until there would be a point where there had like this anger would boil and it would just bubble like have to explode outward eventually. Mm -hmm. The boy's anger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, tell him you can see that. You can see why that would be the case. And just see if there's anything more he wants you to get about all that. That time, that horrible time. It was like he, he tried and tried to be loving and to like to make everybody happy kind of, but then uh -huh. eventually that didn't work. So it became anger, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And see if he does feel like you're getting this and if that's everything, or if there's anything more he wants you to get about it. It seems like that's pretty good. 
Well, you said it seems like, so just ask him and wait for an answer. Okay. Any thinking parts can relax. There's this welling up from the heart. Yeah. And this this sense of just wanting to love. Yeah. Let him know you, you get that that's the way he felt. He wanted to love, but it's too much chaos. Yeah, there's grief there. Is it okay to feel all this? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, let him know. You, you can handle this. He can let you know what it, the grief, the pain of it, everything he wants you to feel too. He's kind of saying too that nothing was ever good enough. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense too? Yeah. Yeah. So ask him once again if he does feel like you're getting all this and if there's anything more. Just kind of like he knows there's there's more but it's going to be a process and we need to come back to it yeah are you willing to come back to it yes so let him know you plan to do that and before we stop let's do this even though there's more to come i'd like you ross to go into that time period and be with him in the way he needed somebody back there. And just tell me when you're back there with him. Yeah. How are you being with him? Just tender and quiet. Great. Stroking his head, holding him. How's he reacting? He's like snuggling into me. That's great. And see if he'd like to just leave that time and place and come stay with you somewhere. He seems a little bit unsure. You ask him about his fear about that. Yeah, he's, he's not quite trusting yet that that I, the, my, me now, that I will handle it. That you what? That I'll handle it, that I will protect myself, that I will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you understand his uh, reluctance then? Yeah. So let him know there are parts that you have to work with still to make it safe for him to come with you. And if it's true, tell him you plan to do that work. You plan to earn his trust as a protector of his. So he wants to stay back there till you've done that? Or does he want to leave and watch you do it? Or how does he want to leave things? Yeah, no, I think he does want to come now. Okay. So he can come to your house there and stay with you there if he wants, or, or to a fantasy place of his choice now.
Yeah, he wants to stay here with me. So tell me when he's there with you. Yeah, he's there with me and I, I'm seeing an image of my older brother too when he was young there with us. Oh, good. Okay. Smiling and laughing. Yeah. Yeah. So your brother came with you. Yeah. Good. So they're happy to be there. Yeah. And we, we could take this next step or not, but just see if he'd like to unload the feelings and beliefs he got back there or if, if that needs more time or he needs to trust you more. It's just kind of like a natural loosening and softening happening. You're good. Just tell him he doesn't have to carry that anymore. He can just let all that go out of his body. Yeah, it's like they're those stock hardened pieces are starting to find pathways out. It's great. Just tell them to keep going until they're all gone. No need to keep any of that anymore. It's interesting. There's, it's like there's grief leaving my system, but it's I don't need to cry. It's moving out in other ways. It's great. You just keep it going. This is what we call unburdening. Oh, how's he seem now? Yeah, he's just kind of like, yeah, it's like he's drinking from his bottle and just like kind of relaxed, drinking warm <laughs> milk kind of. Uh-huh, that's great. That's yeah, great. yeah. <laughs> All right, before we stop, <laughs> let's bring in that, uh, the guy who was the angry protector. Yeah. To see he doesn't have to do that for this baby anymore. And just see how he reacts. Yeah, he's pretty, he's happy. He's kind of like, yeah, there's like a, what's the word? A confidence there. Mm-hmm, it's great. Okay, so how would that feel like as a place to stop? 
Yeah, that feels really good. So thank you, Parts, for letting us do all this. It was a big piece for however long, half an hour, if that. And uh, just begin shifting your focus back outside. And take deep breaths if that helps. How do you feel? Yeah, I'm um, relaxed, open, uh, grounded. Great. That natural sort of um, flow of love from the heart is, is moving more. It's what we call self-energy, yeah. Well, thanks for having the courage to do that in front of your audience and I assume your colleagues. So. Thanks for taking me through that so much. You're welcome. I'd love to, um, I'm sure our audience might have had some questions and based on our time, I'd like to dive into some of those if that works for you. Sure, happy to. Okay. There's a question here from Dawn who says, do you have recommendations for accessing or staying in self, capital S, when you're in conflict with someone whose protective parts are blaming you for the conflict. I struggle to not get caught up in a placating or defensive part, then I end up feeling gross and out of integrity. Thanks. Yeah, and that's one of the most challenging times for me as well. And uh, it's taken time for my parts to trust that I can handle people when they're doing that, they don't have to jump in and protect me. And so that's one of the goals of IFAS is for your parts to come to trust self as a leader, both in the inner world and the outer world. And uh, some of that is just practice, you know, uh, in the moment, noticing the part coming to defend you. And just if you had a microphone in my head, it would be like, it's okay, let me stay, I can handle this. You don't have to jump in. Because these parts are like what in family therapy we call parentified children. They're young and they feel like they've got to run things, they've got to do it for you. And it takes them a while to see there's kind of a grown up in there that can handle things a lot better than they can. If they let the grown up, if they don't overwhelm the grown up with their energy and so it's it's a kind of version of that and it's also very hard to do until you've done some of the kind of healing that we just did because such a person will be triggering some of these very vulnerable parts that carry shame maybe and maybe believe what the person's saying and so then the need for defensiveness is much greater so it helps to do a, a full healing of some of those parts too Thank you. Which that actually leads right into another question from Elizabeth, um, who says, how do you get to the difficult part if the person has a resistance or cannot or rejects to connect with the body sensations to get into that part? Yeah, so that's true uh, for many people in the beginning. And so I would just say, okay, let me talk to or work with the part that doesn't want you to focus on your body and doesn't want to feel in the body. And, and then it becomes the target part for a while. And we just go over all of its fears of what would happen if it let us do that. And there's a way to kind of uh, address each of its fears to get permission. But you know what I learned over the years is with these protective parts like that, I don't push them. If they really are determined to not go in, there's usually a good reason. And so my message is, you're the boss, we're not going to bypass you, we're going to uh, respect your, you know, your right to keep us out of the body. But if you ever did trust it was safe enough to open the door to that, we could do all this healing that would then free you up to not have to work so hard to keep the person in the head or out, out of the body. So it's a kind of a 
what I, I call, I've become a hope merchant. I'm selling hope to these hopeless protectors that there is a different way because they often don't believe there is a different way. They really believe the only way to keep you safe is to keep you out of your body. Thank you. Now, there's a question from Ada again that ties into that, who says, are parts always connected to a particular part of the body? What if a person can't identify where they are? Uh, I'm amazed at how often people can, but sometimes people can't. And so that isn't crucial. I'll just say, okay, focus on it however you experience it. Uh, if it's a just a thought pattern, just focus on the thought or the, the sensation or the emotion uh, or the impulse, just, just focus on that. So we don't have to have it located in the body. When you do find it in the body, that becomes a nice sort of anchor point that you can direct your questions to and hear the answers from. So that's the, the advantage of finding it, but we can still do it without that. Right, okay. There's another question here um, that relates to the process we just went through. This is from Jill, who says, thank you for this demo. Very brave of you, Ross. So clear and straightforward, Richard. Thank you. The question is, what if the child decides to stay where they were? You asked my child at one point, did they want to stay or come with me? And there's a process there. What if they decided to stay? Yeah, and I thought he was going to actually but he finally decided he, he could come with you. Uh, but if he had chosen to, I would have said, okay, uh, and help, I would help you make some kind of commitment to keep coming back to him until he did trust that you could protect him in, in, in this world. I mean, his big issue of not necessarily wanting to come was because he didn't trust you could, could take care of him. And uh, in our discussion, you, you committed to working with the parts that might make that hard. Uh, and I assume they're parts that sort of try to please people or, or don't let you stand up for yourself. And so he got that you were planning to work with that. And so then he was, well, he was free to come with you. But had he not trusted that, I would have said, work with those parts and then come back to him and show him. You got to prove it. You got to prove it to him and earn his trust. Yeah, it just it strikes me. This is just like relating to a real child or a real person. It's exactly the same. It's what I was trying to say earlier. Yeah, it's amazing that way. It's exactly the same. There's a question from Doris. You, you as I was as things were starting to move and release, you said this is the unburdening process. Doris is asking, because there's another term you use, which is unblending. Doris is wondering, is there a difference between unburdening and unblending? Yeah, we, we uh, when a part sort of takes over, we say it's blended with you, it's blended with yourself. And so when it is willing to separate from you, we call that unblending. Uh, so that's not related to unburdening. It's the first step, actually, towards unburdening. But the unburdening was once we got your boy out of the past and he felt safe, then many of these exiled parts are willing to let go of, of the beliefs and emotions they've been carrying all these years. And that's what the unburdening is, is just offering that possibility. And he... You started to do it spontaneously. We didn't have to do the whole process because he just started letting it all go. You were feeling him just letting softening and loosening up and all this stuff was just pouring out of him. And that was the unburdening. Right. There's a couple of different questions from people I'm going to try and synthesize here related to one is um, working, is it possible to use this book, No Bad Parts, as a guide for people to do their own processes? And another person was asking in general, does the book include exercises and processes that we can use? Yes, to the second question. Uh, and in the audio version of it, I lead those meditations, those exercises. 
with my voice. And then uh, the first question is, yes, if you can. <laughs> so some people can do an amazing amount on their own without a therapist and just by reading the book and, and some of the other books. And then other people can't do much at all. So it really depends. And, um, but it's worth trying out and see how far you can go. Um, it's, it's hard for me. I can do a lot with my protective parts, but when it comes to going where you went to these little ones, I generally need somebody there. It doesn't even have to be a therapist, but I need somebody to be accompanying me. That's great. Thank you. And uh, thanks so much to everybody for, for your questions. And it's so wonderful having our live community here, being a part of these conversations and, and creating such wonderful events. Just want to thank everyone in the Banyan community for joining us. And uh, we're, we're coming close to our time. We're not done yet. But before we get to our final questions, I just want to remind everyone we've been talking to Richard Swartz, PhD. His latest book is No Bad Parts. Healing Trauma and Restoring Wholeness Within the Internal Family Systems Model. And uh, I want to thank our podcast producer and our events curator, Jacob Steele, who's there in the background, always handling everything, organizing all of these amazing events and talks that we have. Before we close, uh, Richard, I, I just want to ask about your work with, with IFS Institute. I know that all of this work is based on your investigation and direct experience working with clients and it's all emerged in that way. So what is the direction of ISFS Institute now? Is, is this still morphing and changing as things move forward? It is. We've, you know, traditionally over these 40 years focused on training psychotherapists and we still do that. That's still our main, uh, I guess, um, bread and butter work. But increasingly, I'm getting opportunities to bring it to larger systems. So we're, I've been working with a couple of leading social activists, for example, and we're doing a lot of work where frontline protesters learn the model and they learn when the police come to get their scared parts to relax and, and just stay in self, and not get into their righteous crusading parts. and. Uh, and we're also bringing it uh, through executive coaches to corporate CEOs. And so the idea is that if we can get to these places of influence, then self will, self is uh, contagious. So the more we can bring leaders into self, the more self there'll be in this planet. So this is a, in a small way, a start to do that. That's just fantastic. And I think a, a great way to close with that hopeful vision for this work. Thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz, for taking the time today to be with us. It's just really wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Ross. And again, I'm, I'm so grateful that you took the chance to do a piece of work. It was actually quite a piece of work in a short time. Thanks for taking me through it. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com. <laughs>